so cruelly betrayed her, her eyes settling on a machine attached to her finger, silently monitoring her pulse as her life hung in the balance. But the journey would not end there. What awaited her in Trenborg's hidden bunker was a fate more terrifying than anything she could have ever imagined. For years, Trenborg had crafted a persona of success and affluence with his claims of being a wealthy American stockbroker. In reality, he was a successful doctor, a professional whose expertise would soon be used to inflict untold horrors of his unsuspecting victims. Although a doctor is still a prestigious job, he wanted Isabel to know as little about him as possible. Trenborg is believed to have built the 60 square meter hidden bunker himself, taking him five years to complete. A dark and terrible place concealed behind the guise of machine shed. The walls were concrete, reinforced and twelve and a half inches thick with metal doors double locked to keep his victims trapped inside. The bunker was a twisted imitation of normality that awaited Isabel. A kitchen, bathroom and bedroom all seemingly designed to lull her into a false sense of security. There was even a small courtyard where the person living there would be able to go outside without being seen by neighbors. But beyond the facade lay a darkness that was all too real. This was the place where Trenberg would act out his darkest desires, where he would shatter Isabel's life and leave her with scars that would never fully heal. When Isabel came to, the next thing she knew, she was lying on her bed inside Trenborg's bunker. With no memory of how she got there or what was to come next. For now, all she knew was that she was trapped in a living nightmare. A victim of the depraved desires of a man whose true nature had been hidden from her all along. Isabel said, it felt like one big nightmare when I woke up. I had two needles stuck in my arm. He was sitting on a chair beside the bed. I remember that I felt very surreal and I told myself that it could not be real. Suddenly he started talking to me in Swedish. He told me that the door was the same as they have in bank folds that the walls were made of thick concrete and that no one would hear me scream, no matter how much I tried, and that it was impossible to get out of there. He also said that if I were to attack him and kill him, all I would have left was a stinking dead body. There was no way for me to get out of the bunker without his assistance. There was a small room beside the kitchen in the bunker. When I asked him what it was supposed to be in the future, he said that it would be his own torture chamber. And I don't know if he was joking. He was disturbingly quiet all the time, and I did not know what would happen if he would torture me, kill me, or force himself on me. At one point he told me that if I were to try to escape, he would punish me by chaining me to the bed and feeding me only bread. He only said that he would keep me for a few years and that he would release me after that. Inside the bunker, the victim had been subjected to a never-ending cycle of abuse and manipulation. Tremborg had tried to groom her, attempting to convince her that she wanted to stay with him of her own free will, even as he made it clear that he intended to keep her imprisoned as his girlfriend. The routine was unrelenting, with Tremborg arriving at the bunker at precisely half past seven each morning to take her out into the courtyard. 
this was some sick parody of normality. For the rest of the day, Isabel was left alone, helpless and afraid, never knowing when her captor might return and what new horrors he might inflict upon her. Murder was never far from her mind, a constant dread hanging over her with each passing moment. Isabel said, he said that he wanted to bring another woman to the bunker. He was targeting some kind of celebrity. His plan was to dress as a Paloma and knock on his victim's door and then kidnap her. He said that he would kidnap the other woman as soon as the bunker was totally ready. It would be in two months, give or take, according him. He wanted to install a shower with hot water and a couple of other things before taking in another woman. He asked me if my mom was as pretty as me. He then said, perhaps your mom could be the other girl in the bunker. The thought of him bringing my own mother to the bunker scared the life out of me. Isabel was soon given a contract that was drawn upon by Tremborg. Terrifyingly, it was for a ten-year period. In its pages lay a catalog of demands and instructions that even referred to Isabel as a guest. Each demand was more twisted and perverse than the last. The victim was to provide him with a girlfriend experience during physical intimacy, including French kissing. But this was just the beginning. Tremborg demanded that she shave all her body hair, get a tan and pierce her navel, reducing her to a mere object of his twisted desires. But even this was not enough for Tremberg. He demanded the right to film and photograph her, capturing every moment of her degradation and objectification of his own sick pleasure. Perhaps the most chilling of all were the punishments outlined in the contract. For any act of defiance, refusing to participate in his lustful desires, or attempting to escape would all lead to punishment, with the latter resulting in another five years of captivity in the bunker. She could also reduce the length of her captivity if she participated in the degrading acts that he chose or took part in things such as a fitness program he devised. If she stayed in top physical condition for him, the contract said this would take a year off her captivity. The depths of Tremborg's depravity were matched only by the length to which he would go to maintain control over his victim. He would take vaginal samples from Isabel and withdraw her blood, which he then tested at the lab in his place of work. His claim was that he was checking her for STDs, but it was clear that his true motive was just another means of exerting his control over her, further stripping her of her pride and reducing her to nothing more than an object of his desire. Isabel said, he said that he wanted to have unprotected intimacy with me. I got some pills from him. It was birth control pills, and he told me that he did not want to get me pregnant. At some point, he tried to attack. she tried to attack him with a pair of screws she found in the bunker, but as she was still dazed from the drugs, he easily subdued her and warned her he would shackle her to the bed and feed her only bread if she tried it again. Tremberg saw his attack as a minor setback, but he wanted Isabel to feel at home in the bunker, so he drove back to the, her apartment to gather some of her belongings to make it feel more homely. When he arrived at her apartment, he noticed that the locks had been changed, and upon further discovery, he found that Isabel had been reported missing by her family. Panic setting in, Tremberg rushed home, fearing that he would soon be caught. He drove Isabel to the police station in Stockholm and told her to pretend that she had 
run away to be with him. He wanted her to tell officers that everything was fine and that this was all a big misunderstanding. But even as he tried to maintain his facade, one of the police officers became concerned for Isabel's safety. Pulling her aside, Isabel broke down and the officer quickly discovered the truth, a chilling revelation that would soon bring Tremberg's reign of terror to an end. After nearly a decade of planning and five years of building a bunker, his reign of terror was over after just six days. Police were soon searching his property and chillingly they discovered that he had been stalking at least another ten women on his computer. They found a sordid search history and copies of his contract and plans for his second captive. Tremborg was quickly arrested and admitted to most of the charges right away. He later told police, It was like a military operation. You have to be prepared for every possible problem before you act. She fitted me in every aspect, lived at the right place on the ground floor, or personalities matched and I liked the way she looked. I have been planning this for years. I started building the bunker five, four years ago. The original plan was that she would be there for years. It seemed very tedious to all this just to keep her in my position for a few days. If one looks at the facts while ignoring the small parentheses, the eye abducted the person and injected her with substances. One might say that I have treated her well, in my opinion at least. She was better off with me than in custody of the police. She was supposed to be my girlfriend for years. That was the purpose. But now that I am imprisoned, she will not be my girlfriend in the ordinary sense. Even I can understand that she was not supposed to be a punching bag. We were supposed to be kissing, hanging out, and having physical relations and stuff that normal people do. Tremberg's lawyer said on the first day of his trial that his client had imprisoned the woman because he was desperate to find a girlfriend. There is no explanation for this. This is a high-performing person who is unwell physiologically and he has been longing for a life partner. Tremborg was later sentenced to just 10 years for the abduction of Isabel. I personally find that this is a crazy sentence because his intent was clearly there to do far more heinous things for much longer. Isabel's physical wounds may have healed, but the psychological scars of her week-long abduction run deep. The horror of her experience haunts, and she is tormented by recurring flashbacks and night terrors. Despite her immense courage and strength as a survivor, the thought of facing her capture in court only added to her mounting distress. Isabel's chilling account of her abduction was shared during an interview on Swedish television. She continues on her journey of recovery. Cases like these are deeply unsettling and can instill a sense of fear in people. It's difficult to know the true extent of such heinous crimes and many go unreported or unresolved. The thought of how many people may be suffering in captivity right now is truly terrifying, forced to live a life of utter horror and misery against their will. It's a grim reality that we must acknowledge and we continue to strive towards justice and the protection of the vulnerable. While Isabel's case did have a relatively positive outcome, we must not forget, forget the countless of us who have not been so fortunate. The weight of this knowledge is heavy. Thank you very much for listening. Please like this video if you enjoyed the story and comment your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you.